So our featured speaker tonight is a thought leader, a distinguished academic, a published author, and a dynamic speaker. So let's give that for Dr. Earl Warsinga. Thank you. When we search for the optimum decision, there are two important things. First is how to reach your quality decision. These are the five traits, data and information, context information, creative options, solution techniques, and whether the decision maker is trained and expert. However, the implementation depends on appropriate timing, resources, and changing circumstances under which we don't have any control. So ladies and gentlemen, the outcome is the sum total of these two. And that's what I say something that you may not agree with. Do not judge the quality of a decision by the outcome, but 99% of the people all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have been told my time is up, so I've got to bring it to an end. I have a little more, another 15, 20 minutes, but that's okay. So what you heard was basically the perils and faults of decision making. So hopefully it's a wake-up call for you to take serious note of what you're doing and how things could go wrong. We have developed methodologies to, to overcome it. That's the remedy side. Okay? Thank you, sir. So uh, we'd like to take as many questions as possible. Thank you, Dr. L. Wonderful presentation. Thank you thank for coming here. And thank you, Rob, for uh, bringing such wonderful speakers to, to our sessions. Um, the, when we talk about decisions, but there's still no guarantee that your decision will be successful, it goes back to your point about we should not judge the decision by the... Listen, because everything I spoke was how to make a high-quality decision. I didn't talk about implementation. As you correctly point, the outcome is a function of the quality of the decision and the implementation. So you can have a top-notch decision, badly implemented, and then you say, what happened? So you're right, the outcome could suffer because of the implementation. What happens with logic, intuition, gut feel, experience, decision, is what we call decision contamination, as opposed to criteria contamination. We break down the decision into its minor components and we allow you to contaminate it at individual levels, but it doesn't contaminate the major decision. It's like you looking at a young girl and saying, oh, I love her, let me go out a couple of dates, we get married or whatever it is. That's what I call a decision contamination. It happens so far at the top. But if you had like match.com or something where you put all your criteria and you say, well, these don't match, this quality doesn't match, you have made some mistakes at lower level. It's okay. So the advantage of analytical decision making is, especially in the world of big data and VUCA, this is what's happening. In the olden days, it was easier because we didn't have so much data to bother us. The trouble with AI stuff is, until as, up to now is, it has re removed the feelings component out of it. And I have a famous question I always ask people. I always say, imagine I'm driving my car on a mountainous road. One side is the mountain, the other side is the precipice. There's a truck behind me trying to overtake me. My mother and my daughter in the back. There's an old lady with a baby seated on the side. And suddenly the baby jumps out to pick a ball. I have the following options. Turn right, kill the mother, the old lady. Go straight, kill the baby. Cut left, go down the precipice. Slam the brakes, hit from behind. No machine can decide that for you. It's the context of what? Did you lose six months? Or have you had an accident before that, just coming here? Context has a lot to do with it. Feelings has a lot to do with it. You're gonna make each decision. So AI has still not reached the level where they can take our context in, it will come, the day will come. But right now, feelings are an integral part of, yes, ma'am, yes, Bridget. Um, so maybe you touched on this a little bit by what you just said, but um, somebody like me who's constantly presenting people with a number of options for them to make a decision on, do you have any tips on how do you best present the data? <laughs> and it sounds like helping but, them define their objectives. Yeah, but I'll tell you. <laughs> what you're doing is actually you're negotiating, not decision making. Yeah. That's the catch. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I teach these two because they're so closely related. People buy from people they like. Yes or no? Yes. 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 Right. So what is the key? Likeability. Bridget, don't try to sell them this stuff. Establish a relationship. Forget all that came for. Mm -hmm. Let them go away. Don't push sell. Two weeks later, touch base. 
I talk to insurance companies and I say to them, I get their best sales when I say sell it, sell me, and bombards me with all this data. Fine, hell I am. Why am I even here? Make me feel like wanted and cared for because I will only buy from a person I love. Establish likability. Don't worry about the rest. It'll all fall into place. It, it's a passion. I have three words that govern me. Learn, earn, return. I learned, I earned. Now I come back to return as much as I can. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Well, let's give it up for Dr. Earl. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.